runs in to just pull up stakes quickly and go to New York and try and find a place to live and start in this training court all in January. So McDonald, about two months later, wrote back to me that he could take me in the next fall, which was fine for me. And that's how I ended up in London in September of 73. Let me just check the camera one sec. Make sure it's... Yep. So you started in... When did you start in London? September of 73. Okay. And how would you evaluate the training you got in the three years in Patrick McDonald's school? Uh, it was great. Uh, I mean, on a certain level, Patrick was really concentrated on teaching people to use their hands to direct. And we did a lot of that, a lot of chair work. Uh, he was the only teacher of the course at that point. Wasn't Shoshana on it? No. It wasn't until the semester after, or the term after I left, that she joined him as a partner. So, one teacher for how many students? Well, generally 12 to 15. So that's not a lot of, uh, it's not a really strong teacher-student ratio. Yeah, well, it wasn't what they have now. A lot of things changed. There were only four five training courses in the world at that point. One in New York, the ACAT, which the teachers in the, in the society in London didn't quite accept as kosher, if you can say. Yeah. And because of that two-year training. Yeah. And then the fact that, that uh, Judith Lieberwitz, who started it and ran it, hadn't really trained in London. She'd been trained by a couple of people who trained with, with Alexander. So, why did you choose to train to become an Alexander Technique teacher? Well, essentially, I did it to learn more about the technique. Not so much with the idea of a career in teaching. I just wanted to learn more. And what was it about the technique that you found so interesting back then? Well, one, there was a mystery. And you know, just the possibility. The mystery was because I'd read so much about the technique and studied and even tried to work it out myself and didn't get very far with that. But the one thing I did come away with was the awareness of a couple of things that, well, people pull their head back quite commonly and tended to gasp for air when they were speaking to take in breath quickly. So that fascinated you back then? That fascinated me and the fact that I couldn't find any teacher when I found a teacher who didn't do that themselves. They exactly. Gasp for air. You couldn't find an Alexander teacher who Alexander didn't do that. Alexander teacher. And you still have a hard time finding an Alexander teacher. I still teacher. have a hard time finding a teacher who does that. Who would you say doesn't do that? Or is the least likely? At this point, me. Yeah. Because I've been working on it for so many years. Yeah. Not always in the best of ways, and I've made a lot of mistakes. And learning to, you know, making some progress with it. And I think in many cases with the the old guard, the mm -hmm. Donald Terry and so forth, it probably it wasn't a first priority for them. They were more interested in the problems of training teachers or uh, working with other people. And so they just didn't give it the same regard that Alexander gave it. But the whole point, going back as Alexander you know, mentions in his use of the self, evolution of a technique, that, that gasping is associated with pulling the head back. And what's wrong with gasping and pulling your head back when you're speaking? Well, it, it, it tends to it tends the neck and shorten the spine, narrow the back, puts a lot of stress on the body. So, in other words, the whole point of the technique is to undo that and change that. 
Did uh, people notice any changes in you as you started studying the technique? Did people say, hey, Larry, you're not gasping so much for air when you're talking? Or... Well, most people aren't even aware of it. Exactly. Even the teachers, they're, they're so accustomed to doing it or hearing it, they don't even register it. Exactly. Now, I think with mostly, probably with the, the, that's the whole point with the teachers, the main one, the old guard there, and a lot of other teachers, perhaps that they would just pay attention to it and inhibit, they, you know, everything would be okay. And maybe they do it at other times, but once they start to, start to talk, they fall back into that old habit. I mean, Alexander had a long time when he, he couldn't do it himself. I mean, he had to work a long time to get rid of it. Would you say that F.M. Alexander was the greatest teacher of Alexander Technique? And if not, who would you say? Well, that's, you know, I, that's, that's like saying who is the greatest violinist? Yeah. Or pianist or painter? I know, it's a, it's a fun question. Yeah. It, it, you know, it depends on your point of view and your, your particular interest and, and the taste, if you like. And I've never met Alexander. He died... Uh, 54? 55. 55. Just about the time, just about the time I was going in as a freshman in the college. Just about the time that James Dean racked himself up in a, in a Porsche. So you don't have a strong opinion on who the greatest Alexander teachers of all time? Uh, uh, the story when I was first met at uh, McDonald mm -hmm. here, here, and, and a friend of mine threw a little party for him, a social event, just to, you know, and invited a lot of people. And we were at the event, and, and someone at the event asked McDonald, "Who is the best teacher?" Mm -hmm. And I am. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I am. <laughs> That's what he said. A little twinkle in his eye, and he, he was very good, extremely good. You know, I mean, each each teacher was a little different, and of course you'd have an opinion of who was the best. And you know, it's hard to say, it, depending on probably your your point of view or your interest. A lot of people, you know, were behind Marge. A lot of people were Walter. I mean, probably all had their own their their points, you know, but. Who was the best of them all? I, I never, I never actually worked with Marjorie Barlow. Goldie. What did, uh, what did Patrick tell you, and what did his body language tell you, in his opinion of Walter Carrington and Marjorie Barlow and the other Marjorie Barstow and the other? schools of teaching Alexander Technique? Yeah, they, 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 there was never really much in the way of a direct at, attack on them. It would sometimes, if someone made a criticism of them or something like that, it might nod at me or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> or, but at the same time, he, I'd heard him say he didn't claim to know everything there was to know about the Alexander Technique. And that each one would be coming out a little differently. How come Patrick had such an influence on Alexander Technique in Israel? Does I think it, it was just perhaps a matter of just chance that he, I guess, the Noel Shmuel, Milken, who was, I think, the first teacher who trained and then went back there and started training, and of course then passed it along, although Shmuel and I think had worked with Walter and some of the others. He just probably directed people back to, to McDonald. And then McDonald was, while I was there in London, he would go each spring down to Israel to teach and had been doing so. Now there are something like 4,000 Alexander teachers in the world, does that sound about right? I'm not quite sure of the figure. It could be, could be a few more, could be a few less. You know. And some.